So today in this video, I'll be going over a comprehensive summary and breakdown of everything you need to know about investing in CRISPR. Number one, we'll be going over a clear and simple breakdown, as simple as possible, of the science behind CRISPR. This isn't a science channel, but it's important to understand what you're investing in. Then I'll be talking about the major patent dispute in the sector and the implications of the recent patent ruling and the major scientists involved. Number three, I will be going over each currently publicly traded CRISPR company, looking at profile, pipeline, leadership, important things to know in their stock, and a general overview of the company and my thoughts on it. Number four, I'm going to give you a list of the top private CRISPR companies I'm excited for and waiting to IPO. And finally, number five, I will rank the companies according to how I see them as this video is being made at their current valuations in May 2022. So a huge amount of time went into making this video and I'm excited to have this updated Investing in CRISPR video out with a ton of stuff to get into. And if you'd like to help me keep making content like this, well, if you're new to the channel and Investing in CRISPR interests you, consider subscribing below. And also definitely consider checking out the CRISPR Investors exclusive Discord linked below, which I made and includes a ton of automated alerts, key updates on important developments in the sector, like company updates, insider transaction alerts, new patent publications, CRISPR journal article releases, releases, ARK Invest updates, including my personal CRISPR portfolio, and updates there. And you can check it out and sign up for that on my Patreon page linked in the description or signing up via YouTube membership, which you can click join or click the link below as well. And there's also a free channel just to chat about CRISPR. And one new thing I have been working on is a CRISPR investors website, which is going to be a hub of information about the sector. And that is all going to be on crisperinvestors.com, linked right below, or just type in crisperinvestors.com. And I'm working on that right now, and hopefully in the next few weeks, that website will start looking pretty good. And also, I recently set up a Substack, which is completely free. And you can subscribe and sign up for that linked below as well. I'll be focusing on write-up centered around analyzing alternative and fundamental data from the CRISPR companies. So with all that said, let's jump into today's video. Here we go. So how does CRISPR work? Well, off the bat, we have the word itself CRISPR, which stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. And it describes a pattern that was initially discovered in the DNA of bacteria in the late 1980s by Japanese researchers. The, this pattern consisted of repeating sequences of foreign DNA spaced between bacterial DNA. Nobody initially knew what it was, but with the help of several scientists, like notably Francisco Mojica, an explanation for these repeating sequences was revealed in that it was actually an incredible method that bacteria had of storing DNA from enemy viruses and then using it later as a defense mechanism when said virus came to attack the bacteria so a bacterial immune system so your natural next question is well how did they use this as a defense mechanism well as research continued into the 2000s scientists like Rodolf Berenju, Luciano Marafini, Eric Sontheimer, John Vanderos, Eugene Koonin did a huge amount in explaining how the CRISPR system works. And the easiest way to describe it is that there's a piece that's responsible for attacking and cutting up the viral DNA, and there's another piece that's responsible for guiding this cutting piece to the viral DNA so that it can cut it up, and a third piece that helps the cutting tool latch onto the DNA. So this is the core basic bacterial system that our current CRISPR gene editing methods are based off. But now moving beyond bacteria to bioengineered editing systems in humans, the piece that cuts up the DNA is known as a Cas enzyme. The most popular is Cas9, Streptococcus pyogenes Cas9, specifically being the most popular. And so the part that guides the Cas9 nucleus is known as the single guide RNA, abbreviated sgRNA. And the guide RNA is composed of two pieces, CRISPR RNA and transactivating RNA, abbreviated cRNA and tracr RNA, respectively. And if you remember, we have these CRISPR arrays in the bacteria that contain this valuable information of the location of the DNA. Well, these CRISPR arrays are transcribed to form CRISPR RNA molecules which contain a copy of the repeats. 
And then there's the third and final piece, tracer RNA, which helps in the creation of CRISPR RNA and also serves as a handle for the Cas enzyme to attach to the target DNA sequence and perform its cutting, which it does when the system recognizes something known as a PAM sequence, which is at the target site and is a short DNA sequence that the Cas enzyme must recognize before it cuts the DNA, which is an important component that prevents the bacterial CRISPR systems from attacking its own DNA. So combining tracer RNA and CRISPR RNA into one single guide RNA, sgRNA, was some of the very important work that resulted from the collaboration between Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier, a huge facilitator of the system that enables gene editing and a reason why they were awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2020. And so out of this has emerged the popular CRISPR gene editing, or CRISPR-Cas9, which is frequently notated in that way, because it describes the specific use of Cas9 in the system, which is the cool part in that there's many other potential Cas enzymes that are actually being used now in research. Enzymes like Cas12a, also called CBF1, or Cas12b, Cas13a, Casx, Cas3, and much more. But the question you might be asking is, how does this translate to editing in humans? Well, essentially how it works is the sgRNA, the single guide RNA, can be programmed to target a certain sequence of DNA. And once it takes the editing system to the targeted location, the quote unquote gene editing can occur, which has primarily been a gene knockout which means the Cas editing tool snips away at the targeted spot and creates a double-stranded break in the DNA and knocks out the gene, meaning it will no longer be expressed. And this works well for genetic diseases caused by mutations or clever workarounds, which we will talk about later. One of the concerns with this method has to do with how it's repaired and other concerns I will touch on later. Now there are two main ways to repair a double-stranded DNA break. One is non-homologous enjoining, NHEJ, and number two is homology directed repair, HDR. So NHEJ on one hand is more error prone, but it's more efficient and doesn't need a template to occur. But non-homologous enjoining results in the creation of indels at the site of the DNA break, which are nucleotide insertions and deletions, which results in the gene knockout. Now HDR on the other hand is more precise and has far less errors, but is less efficient. It requires a template for the repair to occur, matching the DNA to be replaced, hence why there's less errors. NHEJ has been the more common type of repair with CRISPR-Cas9 and is used for knocking out genes primarily. On the other hand, HDR can be used for knocking in genes or changing bases because any sequence or copy of gene can be inserted, albeit with low efficiency. Now, one of the big questions right now is what are the potential risks with editing using CRISPR technology in humans? Now, let's be clear, there's been no major study or clinical result that has caused enough concern to stop trials in humans and seriously change the narrative about using CRISPR-based tech that induces a double-stranded break. That said, there have been studies with potentially concerning indications in cells, and one of those concerns is that when editing cells and breaking the DNA using CRISPR, it is selectively promoting the growth of P53 mutated cells, which this P53 gene is huge in preventing cancer, with actually half of known cancers are correlated with a mutated P53 gene. And essentially what happens is that the DNA damage that occurs when a cell is edited activates p53 which then slows down cell division recognizing the damage on the other hand cells with a mutated p53 gene continue to proliferate at a rapid rate and creates risk of imbalance with cells with mutated p53 and potential increase in cancer and another gene related to cancer is this kras gene which mutations of said gene are found in 25 percent of tumors in 85 to 90% of pancreatic cancer cases. The same scenario with P53 natural selection is also a risk with KRAS. Now, chromothripsis, on the other hand, has been another recently pointed out potential issue with using CRISPR, which is essentially like the violent sounding name. It's an event where a cell's genome is completely shattered, where the ultimate result has a broken cell with a completely disorganized genetic structure. Normally we would just say, hey, okay, well, if it's hurting just some cells, what's the issue? Well, the problem is that chromothripsis is frequently observed with micronuclei encapsulating the fragmented genome. And micronuclei forming like this are commonly seen in cancerous cells. So this is another potential concern which surfaced in 2021. 
We don't know yet exactly how much of an issue this will actually be, especially because with the edited cells, conditions that would facilitate chromothripsis have a high likelihood of naturally selecting cells that would actually not be susceptible to said phenomenon. And beyond that, because micronuclei form after cell division, by lining up the edited period before the missegregation stage can occur would be a feasible risk manager. And for ex vivo editing, screening out cells with micronuclei formation, for example, would also be a very feasible method. There's quite a bit being done about ways to combat this. Many promising and clever editing techniques are being worked on right now to make CRISPR safer. And even beyond using Cas9 or Cas12a, which induce double stranded breaks, other enzymes like Casx, Cas12f, or Cas14 or Cas Clover potentially could circumvent this. But all of this has taken the backstage to one of the most exciting advancements in CRISPR since 2012 and 2013, which is base and prime editing that David R. Liu, Alexis Comer, Nicole Godelli, and Andrew Anzalone, many others have worked on developed. The beautiful thing about base and prime editing is that these methods do not require making a double-stranded break in the DNA. That's huge. And the Nature article first introducing the public to this was published in 2017 and announced the creation of two different types of base editors. So we're just talking about base editing here first. So there's cytosine base editors and adenine base editors. Cytosine base editors have the ability to convert C and G base pairs to T and A, and adenine base editors can convert A and T base pairs to G and C base pairs. So without the ability to break DNA and cut it, you might be wondering how many diseases can be addressed by just making base changes. And the answer is actually pretty amazing. So the base editing system uses CRISPR, notably to guide the target area, and also a nickase which nicks the DNA rather than breaking it all the way from there with the help of an enzyme called a deaminase which removes an amino group from a molecule and converts the bases to the desired change. The largest class of genetic diseases are point mutations, which I previously mentioned, just a misspelling in one simple nucleotide letter, also known as single nucleotide polymorphisms. And with just the two base editors, it's estimated they can address 25% of all human genetic diseases. Okay, not bad, but we don't stop there because we have prime editing as well, which takes this up to around 90%. Pretty amazing. Prime editing allows for going beyond the four base changes and doesn't make a double-stranded break either, but uses a special prime editing RNA, PEG RNA, now upgraded to engineered PEG RNA, but this RNA molecule has both the sequence that directs the system to the target DNA sequence, and also it contains instructions for the input changes to be made to the sequence of DNA, allowing all 12 base pair swaps including those facilitated by base editing to be made. Like base editing, the system uses a nickase, some Cas nickase, to nick the DNA, which is fused to a reverse transcriptase molecule. The nicked DNA strand then can be changed, which the reverse transcriptase transcribes from the EPEG RNA, engineered PEG RNA. So prime editing is much newer, just announced in the fall of 2019 when it was first published, but has gotten a ton of excitement since then. For now, it seems that base editing offers more editing efficiency and less errors. So when there's an opportunity to make one of the four changes shown here, to use a base editor, and prime editors offer that flexibility to make all changes. So they are incredibly valuable in giving access to more genetic diseases without making a double-stranded break. So that's a picture of the main CRISPR technology right now, and this was a very condensed summary so you can see how intricate and rapidly developing the system is, even with such a condensed summary being so long. There's so much more emerging areas popping up like transposons and gene writing, but for now that's the main stuff to know for investing in CRISPR right now. Now briefly before we go back to the companies, let's take a look at the patent conflict in the CRISPR sector. Going back to the initially development, as I mentioned previously, Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier were involved with some of the very early research that facilitated the single guide RNA, a major enabler of using CRISPR-Cas9 to perform gene editing in eukaryotic cells. They were conducting their research in a collaborative effort between the University of Vienna, in which Charpentier was involved with, and the University of California, Berkeley, which Doudna works at. But what happened was another side emerged over at the Broad Institute of Harvard and MIT, led by Feng Zhang and Li Kong, who exited the picture when things started to get ugly. 
Feng Zhang saw the massive potential for CRISPR and worked quickly to get the jump on it, seeing the potential massive scientific, financial, and career gains that could be made from getting it to work in mammalian cells. He was already well versed in gene editing in humans, whereas Jennifer Doudna's past was more specific, being a biologist with a focus on RNA molecules. Anyways, Fing used his expertise and made some key advancements, particularly lengthening the single guide RNA so it could work in mammalian cells, as well as making a slight improvement to allow the CRISPR system to enter a human cell, including codon optimization. And with these improvements, they quickly submitted an article to be published, and they also fast-tracked a patent application. And basically, Downa's camp was just behind them because they didn't have the experience with gene editing systems in humans. So on one hand, they proved CRISPR could be used as a gene editing tool, but Feng Zhang, as well as George Church of Harvard, another brilliant scientist, proved it could be used to edit mammalian and human cells specifically. And so if you're following, you can see where this is going. Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier filed for patents claiming their rightful proof CRISPR-Cas9 could edit eukaryotic cells and then therefore extension that human cells could also be edited, whereas Feng Zhang had proved and showed precisely how to edit mammalian cells. But there's a dispute over who proved CRISPR-Cas9 to be able to work in humans. So Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier's group with their collaboration is known as the CVC group, standing for Charpentier, Vienna, and University of California, where they jointly filed for patents. Yes, Charpentier also owns patents herself due to the different agreement between her and her university. And she actually has a licensing company called ERS Genomics for that. Anyways, the CVC group and the Broad Institute have had this dispute since 2015 when the CVC group filed an interference claim with the United States Patent and Trademark Office for Broad's CRISPR-Cas9 patents. And in 2016, the PTAB, the Patent Trial and Appeal Board, officially declared an interference and actually cited the CVC group as the senior preferential party in that interference. Then in 2017, the PTAB actually dismissed the proceedings, saying, oh wait, we actually changed our minds, there's no conflict. So naturally, CVC appeals, but then in 2017, the U.S. Court of Appeals agrees with the PTAB's decision and shut down any claims of interference. But not stopping there, CVC went on to file for new patents directly intended to create interference, which then that forced the PTAB to look into the matter and then make a decision. Interestingly enough, they sided with Broad initially, and after another hearing, they most recently, and this was big news, they sided with Broad once more. Although the CVC group is appealing once more, so yes, this battle is going to continue, and I'm gonna stop it here because this is the main stuff to know about the patent situation, but if you want a deeper, more in-depth look at the CRISPR patents domain and who owns what and which companies have the best IP, check out the CRISPR patents video that I made not too long ago, which is shown on the screen now and also linked below. But the biggest issue with patents, and this is why I will never be a patent lawyer, is because of how much nuance there is. There's so many different ways to word a patent, to change or tweak a claim. All the CRISPR companies do own patents, citing different applications of CRISPR-Cas9 and methods of editing. Obviously, the siding with Broad, which as we will discuss, is a win for Aditas Medicine, who has licensed Cas9 rights from Broad. But the application and extension of CRISPR-Cas9 rights has been enormous. Right now, there's clinical trials with patients' genes being edited by CRISPR-Cas9, and the rights to that said technology as of now is directed to the Broad Institute. But there's a lot up in the air as the CV Sue group has appealed again, as I mentioned. And for another, the Broad would have to sue these individual companies for using the technology, which is a whole other mess. So look, it's a messy picture, and I will do my best in the future here on the Discord and on CRISPRinvestors.com to break down the clearest, most important developments to know. But for now, it's going to be a wait-and-see type of thing. My personal opinion right now is that the news benefits Aditas Medicine more than it negatively impacts the other companies in the future licensing from Aditas to other companies is more likely now, which they have actually said themselves, whereas the other companies have great scientists and R&D teams and are undoubtedly advancing beyond Cas9. Now let's move on and start talking about the companies themselves. Right now, as of May 2022, there are currently seven pure play public CRISPR companies, being CRSP, NTLA, Beam, Edit, Verve, CRBU, and GRPH in order of current market cap. I'm going to go over each company as concisely as possible, looking at a general overview, then their main focuses, main IP, pipeline, leadership, financials, stock performance, and my take on the company. So let's start off and let's talk CRISPR therapeutics. 
CRISPR Therapeutics was founded in 2013 by Emmanuel Charpentier, Roger Novak, and Sean Foy. The company is a Swiss-American company with its main U.S. subsidiary, CRISPR Therapeutics as we know it, headquartered in the United States in Cambridge, Massachusetts. CRISPR Therapeutics is on track to become the first company to get a CRISPR-based gene editing therapy approved by the FDA. Their main IP and license is for using CRISPR-Cas9, which is licensed from the CVC group previously mentioned. The company's CEO, Samarth Kulkarni, has said that they are working on base editors, but that remains to be seen, mainly because of the exclusive patents that Beam has. Looking at their pipeline, their most advanced therapy is CTX001, which they are collaborating with Vertex Pharmaceuticals on, splitting profits 60-40, with Vertex paying $90 million up front, and CRISPR Therapeutics getting an additional $200 million when they get regulatory approval for CTX001. They have shown very strong data thus far, so far indicating that they have created a functional cure for sickle cell disease and transfusion-dependent thalassemia. The therapy is an ex vivo treatment, meaning cells are taken from the patients and then edited using CRISPR-Cas9 and then returned to the body to proliferate. And interestingly enough, the therapy works by increasing fetal hemoglobin, a mutation that patients with sickle cell disease who have no symptoms have naturally in that it produces higher levels of healthy red blood cells, essentially counteracting the sickle-shaped cells that are still being created. So it's a neat hack, so to speak, and clever, but it has been shown to be very effective thus far as a cure, having dosed more than 75 patients so far, and the therapy in fact indicating that it is a functional cure. Next in the pipeline for CRSP, we have CRISPR's oncology platform with CTX110, CTX120, and CTX130. These are all allogeneic therapies, which means the edited cells come from off-the-shelf cells. And as of this video, we have only gotten initial data from CTX110, which was fairly promising data, but not a home run. They saw enough to warrant a dose consolidation for all three trials, meaning they're going to dose patients once more before reporting more data expected by year end. So for CTX120 and CTX130, the first data we get will be after patients are dosed twice, which is expected by the end of the first half of the year, so very soon. Next up, there is regenerative therapies, which is currently VCTX210, a therapy for type 1 diabetes that they are partnering with Viasite for. And the therapy essentially works by using Viasite's stem cell platform designed to restore illet cell function and combined with CRISPR's Cas9 technology to edit the cells to make them less vulnerable to immune rejection from the body and make them last longer. They have begun dosing already back in the fall, and we should get data towards year-end 2022, entering 2023. Finally, we have the company's in vivo pipeline, which there isn't much to talk about as of May 2022, but they are working on four therapies targeting glycogen storage disease, Duchenne and myotonic muscular dystrophy, and cystic fibrosis. The last update we got was that these therapies are probably around one and a half to two years out from initial IND stages. So that's their pipeline, and as far as financials go, the company has a healthy balance sheet with $2.2 billion in cash as of Q1 earnings 2022, and while they are losing around $150 million per quarter, they have plenty of cash to sustain until they get CTX001 and other potential therapies to market. As far as leadership goes, CEO Samarth Kulkarni seems to be doing a good job. There aren't any glaring negatives to point out and a lot of positives. Now with stock performance, a lot of retail investors did purchase CRSP in the hundreds between 2021 and 2022, and since then, as of now, the stock has been the victim of a market-wide sell-off, particularly concentrated in growth in biotech, which has caused CRSP to fall 75% from 52-week highs, currently between 50 and 60 bucks a share. But on the flip side, since IPO, it is up more than 3x, so even though it's down quite a bit, the stock has done well. And eventually, whether the company fails or succeeds, the stock will match the company's success. If they continue to do what they're doing and don't have safety issues, I think it's very likely the company will be worth quite a bit more in the future, with its current market cap 4-ish billion. Let's switch over now and talk Intellia Therapeutics. Intellia was founded in 2014 by Jennifer Doudna in Nesson, Birmingham, and is headquartered in Cambridge, Massachusetts. The company is connected to the CVC group with their IP sublicense from Caribou Biosciences, which itself is sublicensing from the CVC group. So Intellia's main IP is using CRISPR-Cas9 and LMP delivery technology, which they have proven quite capable of on both ends. 
Their pipeline is led by the very promising InVivo platform, which they have produced amazing results from so far in humans in clinical trials. The most developed is in TLA-2001, which is an in vivo therapy, meaning the therapy is injected directly into the body with lipid nanoparticles delivering CRISPR-Cas9 to edit cells in the liver. This therapy is treating ATTR amyloidosis. Basically, a mutation in the TTR gene causes this misfolding protein, which causes all sorts of devastating issues in patients. So in partnership with Regeneron, they have created a therapy, or cure rather, that knocks the gene out, eliminating this misfolding protein it's very effective. So far, it's shown to have been safe, and it's shown long-term durability as well. So bouncing off of this, their other in vivo liver targeting therapies in development have a lot of promise in the similarity. With NTLA-2002, which is treating hereditary angioedema, the therapy is designed to knock out the KLKB1 gene, and this is also in the liver, so a very similar crossover there. In this program being in clinical trials, we are expected to get data sometime soon. Next, we have alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency-associated liver disease and alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency-associated lung disease. Each are separate platforms, but both targeting the Serpina-1 gene. NTLA-2003 is focused on knocking out the Serpina-1 gene in the liver, much like the other programs, and NTLA-3001 is working on inserting a functional copy of the Serpina-1 gene for progressive lung disease caused by the genetic disease. Similarly, also focused on gene insertion is our hemophilia B and A programs in partnership with Regeneron. Intelia has several in vivo research programs ongoing, working with sparing visions for ocular therapies and moving on to add, adding more therapies leveraging their already proven platform. On the ex vivo side, they also have a sickle cell disease therapy, which is in clinical trials and in partnership with Novartis. Their therapy works like CRISPR therapeutics in that it focuses on cre increasing fetal hemoglobin production. And then with oncology, they have NTLA-5001 in clinical trials targeting acute myeloid leukemia, and this is a CAR-T therapy targeting the WT1 antigen. They also recently nominated NTLA-6001, which is a CD30 plus CAR-T targeting therapy for solid tumors. They have several research programs in early stages focusing on expanding their ocular focuses. Leadership-wise, CEO John Leonard has done an amazing job with the company. They have moved quickly and produced tremendous results. They also have a strong balance sheet with almost $1 billion in cash at their Q1 earnings. The only risk with Intellia is that they have just CRISPR-Cas9 IP, and that is licensed, which is subject to change based on the new patent ruling, which is being appealed again but could cause the company to be forced to go to Adidas Medicine for a licensing deal. But I just am not sure if this patent would ever be approved, and if so, there would likely be interference if Intellia tried to treat patients using therapies with base editors. Much like CRISPR therapeutics, the stock has fallen off hard in the last year, not due to anything from the company. In fact, they've only shown more positive news, but it's due to market conditions and the sector-wide sell-off. Right now, with around a $4 billion market cap and down around 75% from 52-week highs, it's hard not to see the opportunity, with the company being so developed and having proven their ability to get things done. The biggest risk is like CRSP, safety issues, and potentially struggling to advance beyond Cas9. Next up, let's move on and talk Beam Therapeutics. Beam is largely regarded as the company with the most long-term potential in the sector, armed with exposure to base editing. The company was founded in 2017, with their primary licensed base editing technology from the Broad Institute, as well as a prime editing license from Prime Medicine to use prime editors for transition mutations, so anything they can use base editing for as well to use within their own pipeline. Beam was founded by David R. Liu, Feng Zhang, and Keith Zhang. The triumvirate from the broad side of the CRISPR sector, you will see their names here several more times in this video. Their pipeline is the only current negative about the company in that it is taking some time to get going and has largely been focused on sickle cell disease and transfusion-dependent thalassemia, which while are very important and addressable diseases, have become saturated in one respect with CRISPR-related companies creating therapeutics for. Anyways, they are taking two main approaches to treating the disease. The first of which increases fetal hemoglobin by using base editing technology, much like the other companies but with a different editing method. The second method, the second approach, is 
beam 102 and this is actually directly targeting the sickle cell disease causing mutation so this is the more classical gene editing image most people think of directly trying to shut off production of the erroneous sickle shaped cells they have gotten an ind approved for beam 101 and are looking to dose their first patient but there is still some time before beam 102 sees their ind approved Next up in progression is their oncology platform, which they have Beam 201, which has been developing well and is in IND enabling stages like Beam 102. This therapy is a CAR T therapy focused on treating acute myeloid leukemia. And they also have a CAR T therapy in early R&D stages targeting T cell lymphomas. With in vivo LMP focuses, they have Beam 301, which is targeting glycogen storage disease 1A, and that is entering IND enabling stages. And then they have two unnominated programs targeting alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency and another program targeting glycogen storage disease 1A, focusing on a different gene, this one being the Q347X gene versus R83C gene from their leading program. In early stages, they have a hepatitis B treatment, and they also have a program in partnership with Apelis and three programs they're developing for Pfizer. And finally, with their in vivo adeno-associated viral delivery for ocular focuses, they're looking to treat Stargardt disease and are in lead optimization right now preclinically. So their pipeline is less developed than the other main companies, but on the other side, and this is the key side here, Beam has shown a strong focus on sub-licensing their valuable base editing technology aided by their lipid nanoparticle LNP Tech, which they have via Verve Therapeutics partnership and primarily with their subsidiary Guide Therapeutics that they acquired in February of 2021. Most recently, they made two big deals with Sano Biotechnology and Pfizer, getting $50 million and $300 million respectively from upfront payments with these deals. And most recently with the Pfizer deal, they have potential to generate over a billion dollar in revenues if all three programs are successful. The expectation that they will continue to sublicense their technology makes Beam an appealing investment even so far away from generating revenue from their own therapies because they can essentially develop a recurring revenue stream from upfront payments and then milestone in royalty payments later. CEO John Evans, I think, is a brilliant person. It has the endorsement of David R. Liu, Feng Zhang, and Keith Zhang, who think highly of him. So I do feel comfortable with him as CEO. The company also has Nicole Godelli as head of gene editing. Remember, she was a co-inventor of base editing technology itself. Now, as far as their balance sheet goes, they currently have around $1.2 billion in cash as of their Q1 2022 earnings and had a net loss of around $70 million for the last quarter. With their ability to make licensing deals before they get to market, there should be no issue with their cash position in the future. Now switching over to the stock, Beam stock is up around 70% since its IPO in 2020 as this video is being made, but it's down like the other companies around 75% plus from its 52 week highs. Beam is currently trading at a market cap between one to $2 billion. So for me, even beyond CRISPR and Intellia, the risk reward seems incredibly promising with the company. As far as risk goes, we still haven't seen base editors in humans, although preclinical data suggests everything to be positive. Next up, let's talk Aditas Medicine, the most polarizing CRISPR company when it was once the gold standard, the beam therapeutic, so to speak, of 2013 when Aditas was founded. The number one issue with Aditas Medicine is that it had a revolving door in leadership and executives, and even scientists have left Aditas to companies like Beam, Tessera Therapeutics, or Chroma Medicine. The company was founded by Jennifer Doudna, Feng Zhang, George Church, David R. Liu, and Keith Zhang. It had potential to be this intersect connecting the Broad and CVC side, and unfortunately, Jennifer Doudna ended up leaving the company early on as she felt that she wasn't really being taken seriously or respected. And since then, the company has done a painstakingly slow job of developing their therapies, and they have had numerous CEO and executive changes with four different CEOs now, as Dr. Gilmore O'Neill is set to take over June 1, 2022. They have had seven terminations or resignations from other executives as well since 2016. So this has been an issue suggesting the company has struggled internally. Pipeline and technology-wise, they have huge potential though. They have access to CRISPR-Cas9 and CRISPR-AS-Cas12a, both licensed from the Broad Institute. They also have access to licensed SLEEK selection by Essential Gene Exxon knock-in technology, which uses AS-Cas12a to knock in genes. Their leading therapy and program right now is Edit 101, a therapy targeting a form of blindness, LCA10, which is currently in clinical trials having already reported initial data in August of 2021. 
The data reported was limited, just showing us data from five patients, but it was actually fairly respectable data. For some reason, the media, though, seemed to want to portray it as a fail. But I believe four out of five of the patients showed some benefit, which is not bad. The plan for now is more data to be reported in the second half of 2022 on adult patients. This will be with at least six months follow-up on the adult high-dose cohort, as well as 12 months of data from the adult mid-dose cohort previously reported. The pediatric part of their trial is well underway now, having dosed their first patient recently. They expect to complete mid-dose cohort dosing of pediatric patients in the first half of the year, and then to begin high-dose pediatric dosing by the end of the year, being 2022. They also recently presented data highlighting the safety of the therapy in the adult cohorts thus far. And so they also have more ocular extensions beyond this with Edit 103 next in their ocular pipeline. And this is for Rhodopsin associated autosomal dominant retinitis pigmentosa. And this program is headed towards IND enabling stages. And at the recent ARVO meeting, the company presented impressive data showing the therapy's potential with the ability to address more than 150 mutations that cause the disease. They also have two other ocular programs in the works. Edit 102 for Usher Syndrome 2A, which is in lead optimization, and a research program not yet disclosed, which they should be revealing and nominating by year end. Adidas also has an undisclosed program focused on neurological diseases, which they have been working on for quite some time and is advancing towards lead optimization. With their ex vivo focuses, they have Edit 301 for sickle cell disease and transfusion-dependent thalassemia. These programs are in clinical trials, with the first patient expected to be dosed by the end of Q2 2022 for sickle cell disease, and for transfusion-dependent thalassemia, the first patient is expected to be dosed by the end of the year. Adidas takes a similar approach to CRISPR therapeutics in Intellia and BEAM, working to increase healthy red blood cells, but they are editing two different pathways, HBG1 and 2 and BCL11A. As far as cell therapies go, EDIT has recently emerged with a candidate that could produce some impressive results, which is EDIT 202, an iPSC, induced pluripotent stem cell derived, uh, induced natural killer INK therapy, targeting solid tumors using double knock-in and double knockout edits with their sleek and ASCAS12A tech. Preclinical data thus far has shown the therapy to be both durable and effective, which are key for allogeneic therapies. Adidas also has a partnership with Bristol Myers Squib Club for alpha beta T cells for oncology, and recently Bristol Myers opted into the seventh program, with one program already advancing to development status. Edit's third oncology program has not yet been nominated, but also is focused on an IPSC induced natural killer cell therapy. Also worth mentioning is their IP, which the main IP edit has is licenses from the Broad Institute for Cas9 and ASCAS12A, as well as Sleek, which they can also sublicense. So this has the potential to create a valuable revenue source in the future, much like Beam and base editing. As far as their financials go, they have $566 million in cash, which they expect to last them all the way for the next almost two years. They only lost around $50 million last quarter, so that checks out roughly. Overall, you can see how wild the last six years have been for the company in the public markets. Since their IPO, they are down around 40% with a current market cap between 700 to 800 million. So with these issues, it is pretty amazing to see that the company has continued to progress and they have developed an ocular program as well as growing cell therapy and hemoglobinopathies focus, which seem to have a lot of promise. The question for now is, will Dr. Gilmore O'Neill, the next CEO, change the culture at Adidas to attract scientists to the company and change the narrative that they have built around being a sluggish company in the space? They have amazing technology, IP, and have shown promising results. As much as a lot of people would disagree, the risk-reward with Edit is very promising, considering the worst-case scenario is their pipeline fails and they just have IP to license, which is pretty extensive. So the opportunity for a company like Moderna to sweep in and just buy Edit for 2 to $3 billion is always a possibility, but I hope it doesn't come to that and they can show us some great data and maybe become a great company. And maybe when you're watching this, potentially in 2025, and Edit is a $20 billion company, who knows? Or maybe you're laughing then because the company doesn't exist. But with that said, let's switch over and let's talk Verve Therapeutics, which although in the rankings, which I will get into in the end, the company isn't number one, this might be my favorite company right now because of how exciting the market they are trying to penetrate is. Verve Therapeutics is a very new company founded in 2018 and is led by CEO Sek Kathirisan, cardiologist and former professor at Harvard Medical School, before leaving to work full-time recently at Verve. 
Also there is CSO and CMO, Chief Scientific Officer and Chief Medical Officer, Andrew Bellinger, who is also a cardiologist with a background as a clinician as well as experience in biotech. Both seem to be extremely able and competent leaders, and the company itself is focused on using gene editing, specifically with base editing, from their license in partnership with Beam to combat heart disease. They plan to first target those with homozygous and heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, and then they plan to target the general population suffering from heart disease and elevated LDL levels. Their licensing deal gives them access to four targets to use base editors for in the liver, which so far they have done a lot with two main targets, the PCSK9 gene and the ANGPTL3 gene. With their leading program right now, Verve 101, focusing on knocking out the PCSK9 gene in the liver, and their second program focusing on doing the same thing with ANGPTL3. Although there's also a lot of promise with potentially a therapy that combines both into a sequentially administered therapeutic knocking out both genes, most recently, we got great news about Verve in Verve 101, their PCSK9 targeting therapy, just PCSK9, got its clinical trial application approved in New Zealand, and they will begin dosing patients there mid-2022, with data expected 2023. They plan to submit a CTA, clinical trial application, in the UK, as well as an IND in the United States in the second half of 2022. In the second half of the year, we should also see their ANGPTL3 program get nominated. Verve also has done great work with LNP research, coming up with their own GAL-NAC targeting ligand LNP, which has produced pretty impressive results in preclinical data. Beam Therapeutics also gets access to these LNPs developed through their deal. So if you like Verve a lot, owning Beam, which owns around 275,000 shares in Verve, is a way to get exposure to them. Beam Therapeutics also has the option to opt into the Verve 101 program in the U.S. and split profits 50-50 as well as royalties outside the U.S. Verve also has a deal with Aquitus for an LMP for its Verve 101 program as well as options for targets in the future. As far as their financials go, at their last Q1 2022 earnings report, they announced $323 million in cash with a net loss of $32 million. So even coming off an IPO raising money, they're going to need to start thinking about raising more in about one and a half years from now. Overall though, the stock is currently down around 60% from their IPO opening price, trading at a sub $700 million market cap as this video is being made. I am excited for Verve because of the opportunity they have scaling up their platform to offer generalized gene editing in vivo treatments for lowering LDL cholesterol in the common population. And as you know, the common population suffering from heart disease is a massive, massive market. So the potential for the company market-wise just is almost unlimited. So the chance for Verve to be one of the biggest CRISPR companies in the future is very real. Next up, let's talk Caribou Biosciences, another IPO from 2021, which actually recently presented an impressive early bit of data from their clinical trials. The company focuses on oncology, primarily with allogeneic therapies, which they say they have found a superior way to multiplex edit using Chardonnay, CRISPR hybrid RNA DNA, the proprietary gene editing method developed by scientist Paul Donahue. Caribou also has a connection to Jennifer Doudna in that she is a scientific advisor to the company, and Rachel Horowitz is the CEO of the company who has worked with Jennifer Doudna and they are friends. So that is a big plus in my opinion. And I also think very highly of Rachel, and she has done a lot of great things, and I hope Caribou turns out to be one of them. There are quite a few pros and cons with the company. The main con is the recent patent ruling siding with the Broad Institute, because Caribou has built a lot of itself on its licensing arm for licensing Cas9 to other companies for non-human therapeutic uses, which Intellia exclusively owns a license to from Caribou 4. On the other hand, there's still a lot of promise for their own oncology platform, which their leading therapy, CB010, just announced some initial data showing impressive results. This therapy uses Cas9 Chardonnays via a license from Intellia, whereas their other Chardonnay-based programs use Cas12A as the enzyme licensed from other companies. Caribou's claim to differentiation is that their system allows for allogeneic cell therapies that are durable, meaning they last long enough to fight the cancer fully. And this has been the major challenge with allogeneic therapies. So 
the companies that can figure out how to make them last, well, they are going to be the ones that will profit. And with CB010, the PD-1 knockout is the main differentiator. With the therapies that are designed to limit the killer cells of the natural immune system, so your natural immune system, from killing the new introduced cells, the new introduced T cells that the therapy introduces. And it essentially makes it harder for the body to recognize the cells. So it's a cloaking mechanism. And the data they released from patients seem to indicate this knockout was quite effective. In five patients, they had an 100% overall response rate and an 80% complete response rate. This makes the therapy the first allogeneic CAR-T therapy with a 100% overall response rate in patients, albeit a small sample size. On June 10th at the upcoming EHA conference, they're going to share more data, so we will see more from that. But it seems while there were some side effects, none were enough to cause serious safety concerns about the therapy, and they have pushed into enrolling patients into the optimal dose level 2 right now. So a lot of exciting things to look forward to from CB010. As for CB011, this therapy I have a lot of optimism for as well because of the immune cloaking specifics and preclinical data which has shown strong durability. CB011 uses Cas12A Chardonnays to simultaneously insert a B2M HLAE peptide which limits the body's natural killer cells from rejecting it, and also knocks out B2M, which limits the T cells from rejecting these edited cells. And this is an anti-BCMA CAR-T therapy, which is focusing on multiple myeloma. So I'm really looking forward to seeing these data coming off the CB010 initial data readout. Beyond this, in earlier stages, the company has CB012, which is for acute myeloid leukemia, and are planning an IND submission for this in 2023. And then CB020, riding on the emerging iPSC-derived therapies, this is a CAR natural killer therapy targeting solid tumors. So with the latest positive data from the company, the future of their pipeline is looking up. As far as their financials go, they have around $390 million in cash as of Q1 2022 earnings. So they are doing fine there and aren't burning too much either, with just around $19 million lost last quarter. Right now, the stock is down close to 50% from its IPO opening price. So yes, it is in the same stock market as the other CRISPR companies, but it really doesn't matter at all and it shouldn't matter to you. Coming off the data from CB010 recently reported, the stock has climbed back a little and I personally think there's a huge amount of potential for Caribou at such a cheap market cap right now, around half a billion as this video is being made. The biggest risk right now is the future of the IP they have licensed from the CVC group and also the test of long-term durability and if safety stays true. Remember, they licensed CRISPR-Cas9 to Intellia for human therapeutics, as well as CRISPR-Cas9 for non-human therapeutic purposes to 14 other companies. So there's a lot on the line there. But on the other hand, the potential reward if they become the leader in allogeneic CAR-T therapies could be huge. So that is definitely something to watch out for. Finally, we have Graphite Bio. And man, this one has had quite the rough year. Graphite Bio was founded in 2017, and the company's foundation takes us back to the beginning of the video talking about homology-directed repair, because that is their primary focus. They use HDR to restore functional genes with Hi-Fi Cas9, a version of the Cas9 enzyme they are in licensing, which has thus far indicated to be potentially more accurate and precise as you can see here. And you can see the improvement they claim to have made based on just using HDR with a donor template compared to the Hi-Fi Cas9 AAV6 system they have. The problem, however, is the question whether HDR and using Hi-Fi Cas9 is going to produce better results than what beam therapeutics or prime medicine can do. As mentioned, HDR is a much less error-prone but less efficient method than NHEG, and so the lower editing efficiency has been a reason why it's not used. Graphite claims to have superior, more efficient editing via technology developed by Daniel Dever that optimizes homology-directed repair to be more efficient. This may be true, but it still does not address the issue of what the company can do that prime medicine or beam therapeutics cannot. And they're also doing something a bit risky in that their leading therapy is focusing on sickle cell disease, which in itself is not a risky focus, but is risky in that it's being attacked by almost all the CRISPR companies, and that at a certain point if they aren't showing a significant safety or efficacy improvement or a cost improvement, why would a doctor recommend their GPH-101 therapy, which by the way is still in early stage clinical trials, to a patient? So the big thing for Graphite, in my opinion, if they do in fact have a successful gene editing method, is to expand to other domains not currently being developed, which they have plans to, as you can see here, with X-linked severe combined immunodeficiency and Goucher disease 1A in the works. 
Programs like Alpha-1 anti-trypsin deficiency are also sources of optimism. But a lot will come down to what the company can be able to do and if they will be able to back up what they say. CEO Josh Lehrer thus far seems to be a fine CEO. Of course, that will change for the better or worse depending on how the company does. Behind them, there's Matthew Portis and Maria Grazia Roncarolo as scientific advisors who are both very accredited individuals. Also worth pointing out is Samsara Biocapital is a firm that has bet a ton on Graphite, a major shareholder owning like 14% of the company with a $35 million equity worth right now. And they have bet so much and they have purchased quite a few more shares as the stock has decreased. The stock performance has been pretty amazing in its downfall, following 80 plus percent since its IPO as this video is being made. It's hard to justify owning a large stake in the company because of the risk, but their alternative method of gene editing does offer some appeal in that it's different than the other main companies and safety wise could prove to be very different if something comes out about the other companies' trials and using SPCAS9 for gene editing. But the reverse, of course, is also true. Now, as far as private CRISPR companies go, first off, I made a complete video going over all the top ones back in fall 2021, and that video is still very relevant today and fairly up to date. So definitely check that out, and that's linked below in the description box. But for a list of the top companies right now, here we go. We have Prime Medicine, number one, and then Mammoth Biosciences, Excision Biotherapeutics, Sherlock Biosciences, Scribe Therapeutics, KSQ Therapeutics, Tessera Therapeutics, eGenesis, Inscripta, Pairwise Plants, another Zhang Lu and Zhang Company, Arbor Biotech, a Feng Zhang Company, Locust Biosciences, Refugee Biotechnologies, Ligandel, Colossal Labs, Chroma Medicine, Plant Edit, Spotlight Therapeutics, and Inari Agriculture. I know this is a lot to throw at you, but in the future, all these companies are going to be neatly put together on CRISPRinvestors.com, probably likely when you're watching this now. So make sure to check on that website because hopefully in the next few weeks, and I'm putting this video out in mid-May, that website will be looking pretty darn good. Finally, let's get to my current rankings. This is how I rank the current public CRISPR companies long term and factoring in their current valuations. Number one, I have Beam Therapeutics. At this point, from what we've seen from base editing's ability to edit without a double-stranded break and its precision and efficiency, plus the company's leadership and licensing capabilities, with their market cap sub $3 billion right now, it's the number one CRISPR company in my eyes right now. Number two, I have Intellia Therapeutics. This is factoring in the amazing data they've shown thus far, proving their pipeline, as well as their financials and company strength with John Leonard as CEO and the company moving so efficiently and overall doing all the right things. Their market cap being sub 4 billion has huge upside in my opinion, especially with their oncology and hemoglobinopathy segments developing rapidly. Number three is going to be CRISPR Therapeutics. And this was actually a tough call because of Aditas Medicine's valuation, but CRSP has been doing so many of the right things with their manufacturing facility actually recently winning the company an award. They are the closest to full FDA approval for their sickle cell disease cure, and have shown promising oncology data and expanded into regenerative medicine. Their in vivo focuses, albeit well behind Intellia, is a promising indication that the company will continue to move forwards. With $2.2 billion in cash, they have the biggest safety net, although the Cas9 singular exposure does add some risk. I think their cash position gives them this spot at number 3 though because they have the ability to make an acquisition or initiate a licensing deal to keep themselves at the front of the space. Number 4 is going to be Aditas Medicine. Edit. Yes, the leadership and scientist departures is concerning and is a big reason for the slow development, but they still are here and are still making progress, especially recently. They have great technology and have the immensely valuable foundational Cas9 IP, now licensed from Broad, which they will likely be able to license out in the future, as well as their AS cas 12 a and Sleek technology. Their Edit202 cell therapy has shown some of the most promise I've seen from a preclinical CRISPR-based cell therapy, and Edit101 still remains to be seen. The valuation now sub 1 billion changes things for me with the leadership issues because the company itself, even being run by a 7 year old, has inherent value in its technology and IP and pipeline, which at some point makes it an appealing acquisition target in my opinion. We aren't there yet, but we need to give Dr. Gilmore or Neil a chance. Number 5 is Verve Therapeutics. And this is for the sole reason that we haven't seen any inhuman data yet, which is also true for Beam, but Beam has the exclusive license to base editing technology to generate revenues, whereas Verve doesn't. The company has their LMP technology and has a great plan with how to treat ASCVD market one step at a time. 
knowing that 18 million in the U.S. have cardiovascular disease alone and 94 million have high cholesterol levels, there is a massive, massive market for Verve if it can get there. The recent CTA approval shows that the company's leadership is driven to execute at a quick pace and could grow the company exponentially. At the valuation here well below $1 billion, Verve is a company that checks many boxes on my list. Number six is Caribou, and this is primarily because of the uncertainty with their Cas9 foundational license, which is being appealed, but I doubt the decision changes. The recent CB010 data offers a lot of promise, and they have a great plan on targets for improving cell therapy durability. I would like to see if long-term durability holds true and what side effects look like in a larger cohort. Their push into IPSCs is key for the company. The opportunity is here and at this valuation they could easily be a behemoth company long term, especially if their data generalizes to all patients. Keep a close watch on Caribou. Finally, last place goes to Graphite Bio at number 7, which is simply where it must be. The company hasn't proven anything yet in humans is only going to delay the more important parts, which is expanding into other diseases not yet being developed and addressed by other companies. Graphite should not be overlapping in already addressed areas. The company could very well break out and surprise a lot of people, but that's not to say the odds are stacked against them. I don't have anything negative to say about them yet until I see data, but for now they are in last place. So while we've covered a lot in this video between the science behind CRISPR, the patent situation, a deep look at all the public CRISPR companies, a mention of the private companies, and finally the ranking. And if you've actually made it all the way this far, it's a long video and watched all the way through, I am curious to know. So if so, comment below CRISPR in all caps if you have made it this far to let me know. And if you like this video, a lot of work did go into making this. So if you'd like to support the channel and help me keep doing this and making content, consider signing up on Patreon as a patron for monthly summaries, the exclusive Discord, or sign up below through YouTube tiers as well for the same. This helps me keep the channel going, which takes a lot of time. And also definitely check out the CRISPR Investors website and subscribe on Substack for free below. Thanks for watching. Make sure to hit the subscribe button if you haven't already, and I will catch you next time.